why you said multiple times in the interview that uh, the present is science fictional, I believe you put it. And when I read that, I was sort of like jealous of you because I feel like my life is so not exciting and science fictional. I was wondering what you meant by science fictional or that the present day is so science fictional. Sure. Uh, well, I think it's very true that we are living in a science fiction novel that we all collaborate on. And it's because the, the everything that science fiction was about through its, its historical named period, the 20th century, has, has kind of come true. And also, um, we live in a world that is so intensely structured by science and technology that we can't get out of it. We can't. If we were to get out of it, it would still be a science fiction move, the retreat to the farm. So it's a it's hegemonic. You can't escape it. We're in that um, a world created by science and technology. And so, the, and also, there's this intense sense of futurity, in that if you opened up your laptop or your newspaper tomorrow and it said, you know, they cloned six South Koreans successfully and they're all named Kim. Um, you would believe it. There would be no surprise there. Anything could happen. You know, you could, you could say, well, we just got a signal from Alpha Centauri. There are intelligent aliens there. They sent us, uh, you know, the code for pi and Pythagorean theorem. And uh, you, there's no reason to disbelieve that either. So we live in this world of uh, anticipation of strangeness, of, of, uh, of change, rapidly accelerating change. I came through the Atlanta uh, airport today, and you know those uh, um, speed walkers that are underneath the various terminals? Well, out, when I was a, a young, there was this famous bestseller, Future Shock, by Alvin Toffler. Well, Future Shock, you don't talk about that anymore because none of you are shocked. And that's because the shock comes at the moment when you step on the walkway and you feel the drag between one acceleration and another. You be, when you're, when, at the moment when you're being accelerated to a new speed, there's a little gravity drag on your body. And that's the moment of future shock, 1972 or three. And then when you're walking with the walkway that's moving at a different speed, there's no shock there. You simply are moving at that speed. So now we're moving at a historical speed that was faster than the historical speed was when I was a kid. And that moment was marked by this book, Future Shock, and it's an archaic term, <coughs> obsolete, because there's nothing in our experience now. I don't think there's anything that could happen that would shock us because we're moving at such a fast speed now and because we're conditioned by science fiction. What about the other end of the runway? When you slow down. Yeah. Well, uh, that's another, you feel that too. You go, oh, God. <laughs> this is when, like, um, when your, your connection to the internet goes out for three days or your phone line or when your cell phone dies. These moments when you're suddenly not having the sixth sense of the cloud, uh, or if you go on vacation to Thailand and you don't take any of your stuff. There are these moments where you get that opposite sensation too, the slowdown moment. I go backpacking. And the first day of my backpacking trips, I start hiking, an hour passes, and I realize that having walked for an hour, I'm now going to walk for six more hours. And that's an uh, altered state of consciousness. Everything changes, and so that's probably that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, playing off what you're saying about living in science fiction reality, it really seems like it's a certain kind of science fiction reality. If you look at the world around us today, we don't have flying cars or jetpacks. We do have planets. seems to be that the 50s, the 40s, and 50s science fiction is still science fiction, but like the John Brunner science fiction is the reality. So there is still something you could tell me about the world today. I would say, no, that's not possible, like teleportation or rocket packs or planetary ecological solutions, <laughs> unfortunately. So uh, how much of that science fiction viewpoint is founded in the continuity or contiguity of, of from the 70s and from Tuffler and that whole era of the first cyberpunk authors and that view of science fiction and, and really the how far into the future we can really think the speed of which we're moving. It seems like there's a disconnect. Well, 
there's, yeah, those are the last uh, comment that you made, that we, it's harder and harder to think very far into the future because of the speed at which we're moving. If you say, what are things going to be like 30 or 40 years from now, you just have to shake your head and say, who can tell? It, it's contingent on so many things in between. And I, I sometimes conceptualize it, this is another backpacking type thing, as a peninsula, that we're, we're going out a peninsula that um, slides off steeply on both sides, uh, either to a disaster or to utopia and permaculture, but that we, there isn't a big plane out there where we can muddle along and be halfway between the two. The, the ecological situation is such that unless we solve the problems, they will really crash the system. And there's any number of disaster novel scenarios. Essentially, if we run, if we run out of, if we have a, a prolonged electrical power breakdown uh, in the grid, or if we have food shortages, uh, within weeks we could be seeing anarchy followed by a police state, followed by mass death, followed by tribalisms of the worst kind. And so the disasters are all too easy. Uh, we really are on a peninsula. On the other hand, we have enormous technological powers. Um, there could be a moon base in 10 years. There could be a Mars base in 20 years. We could be cloning things. We could be through genetically engineered um, organisms. We could be um, uh, feeding a population of 6 billion. Um, the, the technological powers available to us as science extends its reach out in all the different science fiction fields, moving out with the enhanced power of computing, computers, and just the increase in what we know and how good our methods are, <clears throat> there remains a utopian possibility. Uh, and, and so the, the teleportation, now there, one thing science fiction always had was the magic stuff that was never going to be true but was interesting metaphorically. Time travel, faster than light travel, these were never going to happen, and yet we loved them because they, uh, for one thing, the universe is too big to get to it, and so if we want to get there and play the game of the galactic empire, the kind of Asimovian galactic empire, you have to lie about the size of the universe. You have to make up a trick faster than light travel. Oh, well, this is a nice convenience, and then we can play, you know, like we're Alexander Dumas or something and, and treat the galaxy like it's an adventure land. But that's a different kind of science fiction than these kind of more like Jules Verne. You know, you could have a submarine that could stay underwater for a year. Well, this is just extrapolation from something that is clearly possible. So there's realistic science fiction and unrealistic. And almost all the realistic science fiction options have either come true or are still viable, are, are still possible futures, I should say. The disasters, we don't want to call viable, but they're definitely so I think that's what's going on. And, and now everybody's just habituated. It's very hard to write a science fiction novel right now. I mean, how is it different from a realist novel? I don't, I no longer really know. I don't think it's an easy distinction to make anymore. Once science fiction is realism, then you have no science fiction as such. 